Lori Branson Legacy Sabbath School. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an educator. You can't take that out. Um, we are starting, we started last week with this book where Dave Larson interviewed our resident author. And um, if you still don't have one, you can get it on Amazon. Make sure that you don't put in Bill Johnson. It won't come up. Uh, you have to actually put in William Johnson with two S's, and then it will come up. So we're going to be um, having some distinguished guests who have been here before. And I particularly want to um, introduce you to Kendra Halovic. Right? Did I say that correctly? Close. Hello, Viac. Uh, Valentine, and she married her husband, Gilbert Valentine, in 2010, um, so fairly recently, and she was on the task force to the NAD, North American Division, when we were talking about women's ordination, so it only made sense for them to come and talk with us today. They are both over at La Sierra University, and have written all kinds of wonderful things, but I want to hear more from you than the introduction. So I apologize for cutting it short. We'll let you guys come up, and if there's anything you wish to share about your articles you've written, I'll let you do that. Is that okay? Yes. It's very good to be with you this Sabbath morning. We're looking forward to this conversation together. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for this place of study and learning. We thank you for Sabbath morning. We thank you for scripture. We thank you for the Adventist Church. And we thank you for books that challenge us and give us hope. We invite your presence here as we participate together. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, it's a delight to see so many here this morning. We thought that because this was the beginning of summer, we might have five or six in the front row. But uh, good to see so many here interested in a topic that uh, is very current and very relevant. Um, what we're planning to do this morning is we're going to reflect for a little while together on the chapter that you've all read for your homework this past week. And then we'll react to what we've read in the chapter and just share our, our reflections together and then leave lots of time for questions. Does that sound... That's what we've agreed to do anyway, as a, a way forward. Um, so my turn first. I, I get to talk about the book generally, but particularly about the first chapter. Um, we're looking at this book, as uh, has been mentioned in our introduction. Bill is contributing to the beginning of a new genre. Did you know that? This is post-San Antonio. The first edition in the series was post-Atlanta. Did you read that one? Jan Paulson's book, Where Are We Going? This one is Where Are We Headed? Both post-traumatic events. Jan Paulson's book was reflecting on the trauma of 2010, the GC session. This one is reflecting on the trauma of 2016, um, 2015. And of course, facing doubts, this is another senior church administrator, Raina Brunsma, who's reflecting on where we are, where we need to be headed. And of course, Jan Paulson. I couldn't find my copy of Where Are We Going? That's his follow up copy. Let's talk. But they're thin books. So this is the thin book genre. <laughs> <laughs> but, Really, it's unprecedented. We are in unprecedented times where senior church, highly respected church administrators are reflecting in a gentle, profound, but critical way on events that, are, that have brought us to where we are right at the moment. Um, firstly, let me say how much I enjoyed this, this book, and particularly the first chapter. Um, it's Bill Johnson's inimitable style. Short sentences, it's engaging, it's conversational, you know, it's not, it's scholarly, represents a, prof 
a huge range of learning, but it's, it's very conversational, kind of like what you read when you read his editorials in the review. Um, I don't know anybody who can get away with, with fragments like Bill Johnson can. <laughs> One word sentences, two word sentences. Do you let him do that, Nolan? <laughs> but it's very engaging. One sentence paragraphs, would you believe? If my students do that to me, I say that you can't, you can't hand in a one sentence paragraph. That's not scholarly writing. Well, you can in Bill's book and enjoy it. And it makes it vital reading and, and very engaging. So thank you for, for the instruction from your style of writing as well, Bill. Um, <clears throat> the first chapter, the battle is over. Um, and we just want to briefly outline what that chapter is talking about. Um, Bill begins with, or, yeah, Dr. Johnson begins with a, a review of the history of women in ministry and, women, and the ordination issue. Um, he deals with the discomfort that early Adventists had and their community had with Ellen White's role as a woman and how in those early years the men came to the defence of, of Ellen White. Vigorous defence, lengthy defences. Um, the Smith Articles and, and all of those. Then he alludes to the 1881 uh, General Conference Session discussion of whether women should be ordained as, or not and how that was parked. I want to come back to that a little later in my reflections. Um, he, he highlights the fact in this brief review that Ellen White was a card-carrying member of the ordained clergy. And that's an anomaly. That's a real anomaly. He, he reflects on that. Um, so that's the, the post, um, no, the pre Ellen White era. Then he moves to the section after Ellen White's death, the post Ellen White era, and reflects on how uh, we've had varying responses to women in ministry, but coming up to about 1980, um, under Wilson, the decision about women in ministry moved from annual council to main stage, general conference session. That was a significant shift of, of our reflection and, and the level of discussion and um, reflects changes in polity and in um, the status of the discussion, I guess, and also has complicated it no end. Um, he talks about the consensus statement in, uh, that was achieved in 2016 that, that had inherent contradictions and yet was a way of embracing um, the fact that we couldn't agree theologically um, and biblically, but there was a way forward. So that the first part of this chapter, this first chapter, is a, a review of what's happened and where we are now. The second half, which Ken was going to talk about, is where we go from here. Yes, what <laughs> lies ahead is the next section. And he mentions five different clusters of ideas. Uh, the first is that the wall is toppling, that ordinations are continuing, and that there are greater numbers of women in ministry, not only in places where we might predict there would be, the United States, uh, Europe, Australia, but in maybe some places that would be surprising to us, places like Papua New Guinea, where women are joining ministry and uh, the islands of the South Pacific, etc. So he mentions that the wall is toppling in practice. In many places, as we all know, um, how people get their credentials and what kinds of credentials and if there's a difference between ordination and commissioning credentials, etc. All of that is being discussed um, all over the world. Second, that it is a moral issue, a matter of conscience. Uh, this is true for individuals as well as for unions. So this gives a, a new, for, for Dr. Johnson, this is a, a new part of the, of the story. The third point that he makes is he calls the bogus nature of the arguments against ordination. Uh, and here's where he goes through a, a list of things that um, he thinks are, are just too weak to ultimately stand to, for example, say that, that ordination of women is purely a result of the women's liberation movement, um, or that it's a slippery slope 
um, and therefore should be challenged uh, theologically. Uh, the whole headship heresy argument uh, that these are these are ways in which they can these these arguments are ultimately going to fail. They are they're not strong enough against the situation as we now have it. Fourth, he mentions that millennials um, are changing the conversation as well with their impatience with the church, that for them, for so many of them, this is a non-issue, they don't even understand the question. Um, I can testify to this in classes. I would, building up to San Antonio, I thought, man, we should be talking about this in class. And so I would occasionally say, you know, would you like to talk about this before the summer break, knowing that um, San Antonio is coming? And over and over again, it was basically no. Um, this is not an issue that we're engaged with. It seems very, um, it seems like an issue of our parents and grandparents' age, not our age. Very interesting reaction. And I'm not saying that's across the board, because we have millennials who are taking a very strong anti-ordination of women's stance. But um, by and large, um, for so many people who are in the workplace and where any profession <coughs> is available for women as well as men, this really does seem a strange discussion and argument. And then finally he mentions laughter. He talks about the idea of the, the absurdity and the impact of social media and sort of making fun of ourselves. And, and really, this is an issue. Uh, so these are some of the things he mentions to kind of help us get more of a, of a widespread flavor of what's happening when it comes to the ordination of women. And uh, ends his uh, chapter reminding us of these elements as well as the, the historical ones. So we're now going to reflect um, on our reaction to the book and I'll do my reflection on the, on the basis of, of some interest in Adventist history. Um, and then Kendra will reflect more from her involvement in TOS. So we're going to leave lots of time for that. Um, so I'll go very quickly. Um, Dr. Johnson wrestles with the issue of how come this movement, this Advent movement, is so having such difficulty with the ordination issue when Ellen White was so instrumental in, in our founding and in its early years. Um, and um, the whole issue of she carried credentials. Um, I, I'd just like to reflect on that a little. We, we wrestle with the idea that she never had hands laid on her. So she wasn't ordained in that sense. She, in fact, just was issued credentials from the Michigan Conference. 1871 was the first time she was issued credentials. Um, and when you look at that closely, um, why was she issued credentials at all? Um, basically, it was an economic reason. They didn't have any other way to, to find a basis for paying her for the work that she did. And she was accompanying her husband around camp meetings and writing and preaching and all nicely voluntary. They needed a way to pay her. And so they recognized her as a minister and paid her a full-fledged ordained minister's salary. That was the, the reason why it got started. The next year when they came to renew the credential, they didn't have to think hard. They just simply said, we'll renew the credentials for the following ministers and her name is listed as a minister. No debate whether licensed, about whether licensed or ordained, she was just a full-fledged minister. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, they didn't lay hands on her. But is there any difference from laying a hand or raising a hand? <laughs> because they all raised their hands and said, yes, we agree she should be a minister. We'll recognize her as a minister. So, you know, we make a, a lot of funny business about laying on a hand or raising a hand, but it's public recognition of her status. And we, we haven't really ever come to, to grips with that. Um, I'd like to suggest a, another wrinkle on the Ellen White thing, um, just to, to be a little heretical today. Always got to have 5% heresy in the discussion to make it worthwhile. Um, you know, we... we <laughs> Oh, just kidding, just kidding. Right to an yeah. <laughs> we've, we've grown up with the idea, you know, that Ellen White was the second best. In fact, it was a choice that God had to make because the other two options didn't work out. 
we work through William Foy, we work through Hayes and Foss, and oh goodness, where do we go next? God chooses Ellen. And she says yes, and well, this is the weakest of the weak, you know, just to prove that, that divinity can really make something out of something weak. So that's the, the theory that we've grown up with about Ellen White, isn't it? It's a myth. Did you know that that is a myth? Kevin Burton, just in a recent article, you read on the website, Spectrum website, powerful articles, recent research, that that story didn't emerge until the 1920s. <laughs> when Adventism was embarrassed in front of fundamentalists, that she had started this sect, and so they f found ways of, of explaining and softening her role and finding some sort of justification. But it didn't emerge as a story until the 1920s, as did some other very distressing things I'll t talk to you about in a moment. But how's this for an alternate way of looking at the Ellen White role in Adventism? The traditional is... God needed a prophet because you can't have a remnant without a prophet, right? So you, God needed a prophet, couldn't find a man, found a woman. What if the story really was, for a remnant movement for the end times, God needed a woman? And the only way a woman's voice could be heard was to invest it with charismatic authority. So really, it was... The feminine perspective that was necessary in the movement. We wouldn't have had one otherwise. Okay, decide whether that's heresy or not. Um, but I think it's got some, some merit in it. And I've got another couple of minutes just to reflect on one other thing that, that Dr. Johnson raises and is, tries to address in a way that um, avoids misunderstanding. A lot of the resistance to women's ordination is because there's a thought that it comes as a direct result of the feminist movement. And this is the pressure of society, and Adventists are not a church that responds to the pressures of society. And, and so we, we've got to find other ways of explaining the emerging role of women and the role of Ellen White. Not, not the fact that there is this feminist background. Now, he, he's right. There, there is no vigorous, hard-edged, aggressive, angry background to the emergence of, of Ellen White in our midst. So when Dr. Johnson had, says that's not the feminist that produced Ellen White, he's correct. But I think it needs a little more nuancing than that, and I would suggest so, because in fact Ellen White's role in our midst would not have been possible as a woman unless there had already been significant change in society. The emerging role of women as speakers in public was already underway, and Ellen White was part of that, and what she was able to do was because of changes that were already in place. Not the hard-edged side, side of things, but the fact that women were already in, in Methodist roles in preaching, and she was aware of this. She compares herself to other women preaching, and, and she validates the preaching of other women when she meets other women at, um, and other congregation folk at camp meetings. So I, don't, I think part of the reason you can't stop the dawn is not just because of Joel 2 and the Lord will pour out his spirit on all flesh in the last days. You can't stop the dawn, in my perspective, is because the, the releasing of women from bondage is a substantial movement in our society that's already underway and it will continue. And, and we are part of that. And if we try and resist that, we're, it's like stopping the tide or stopping the, the door. You, you, you can't. Um, in, in my historical research, I've, I've looked at um, the, the context for Ellen White's role. Um, when she was in New Zealand in 1893, she was well aware of the temperance movement and the suffrage movement. They were running a camp meeting just two miles away from the Capitol building in Wellington. And, and they had to delay camp meeting because it was election time and it was the first election when women had the vote. First country in the world. That was all part of the atmosphere. When she was in Australia two years later, the Anglican Church was ordaining deaconesses. And it was a big thing in the discussion. Big in, in the newspapers, because 50% of the population was Anglican. So it was all over the newspapers, all over the Anglican papers, and in the air that Adventists breathed. 
And so the discussion that Ellen White has about ordaining women in ministry in 1895 was very much part of the social development that was taking place. And um, I need to let time have time for, uh, for Kendra. But we're aware, this is, I'll finish with this. Um, we're aware that in the 1920s, 1930s, there was a resistance to women in ministry or women in leadership at all. We, we've been vaguely aware of that, and Dr. Johnson alludes to that. Recent study in the last three months, a new paper that's just out, Kevin Burton, it's on the website as well of Spectrum. I had a chance to read it several months ago. Um, has, has discovered that in fact the male only approach to women, well, to, to ordained ministry, emerged in 1930. Up until that time, there was at least the possibility of women in ministry, ever since 1881 and around that time. Women licensed ministers, but there was the possibility of women in full ministry. But because of the fundamentalist reaction, Adventists became nervous and sensitive about women and Ellen White's role. What he was able to document was that in 1916, Adventists first made a report about themselves to the Census Bureau for Volume 2, the, the volume that dealt with descriptive narrative of organisations. In 1926, they did another report. And in those reports, the General Conference reported to the government that membership in conferences, presidents, secretaries, treasuries, and the officers, was open to people of all genders in Adventism, as was the ministry. They stated that. H.G. E. Rogers was the one who drafted the, the statement to the, um, to the Census Bureau. Then we developed the first issue of the working policy for the GC and our first manual. And then in 1930, when they made their next report to the, to the government in the Bureau, in the Statistics Bureau, they deleted the sentence from the report. This is the sentence. Membership in the conferences or the ministry is open to both sexes, although there were very few female ministers. That was in 1916, 1927, 26. The next report, they deleted that sentence intentionally. And it became a male preserve. We are part of the, the, the liberation of women. We live in that world ever since those meetings in Rochester a long time ago. We dislike the excess, excesses, and they should be resisted. But it is a different world. Women can own property, they can get divorced, they can go to professional school, they can become doctors and be called doctors, not commissioned physicians. <laughs> Why in the world could we call a woman medical practitioner a commissioned physician? <laughs> doctors, okay? So we, we are totally inconsistent. And the, the resistance to women in ministry has, has emerged with a sharp edge. 1930, where ordained ministry became by fear of a group of men in Washington, not a GC session, not an annual council, just people who were writing manuscripts at the General Conference. I've talked too long. Please, tell us all about TOS. <laughs> well, let me first have some reactions to the book first, and oh, then yeah. and then I'll, I will talk about um, uh, TOS a bit. Um, I, too, so much appreciated Dr. Johnson's book. Um, in our assigned chapter, chapter one, I was amazed. There's a whole section where every paragraph, if you've read the documents that have come out of the church over the decades, every paragraph is a clear and careful summary of pages and pages and pages of material. That is quite a gift, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. To make clear for the general reader who hasn't had the opportunity to read all those documents, but to be able to see the, the history in a, in a careful summary way. I was just amazed at that. Very engaging writing. Um, 
Uh, I appreciated so much a comment, a phrase on page 20, uh, where he mentions, we have put ourselves into a logical and theological bind. And I do think that's where we are. Um, a very thoughtful way of, of, of encompassing so much of Adventism right now that we're, we're wrestling with and figuring out how to move forward. Um, on page 15, Dr. Johnson mentions that he was surprised by a, sort of a new angle at this issue, and that was the ethical concern. And if it's okay for me to say this, I was surprised that you were surprised. <laughs> um, and let me, just, let me just share what I mean by that. Um, going through the time at Sligo Church, as the congregation was thinking about um, whether or not post-Utrecht, that it, it was time. It was time to do this. In my mind, at least, um, the conversation was very much about the ethical ramifications of a community trying to live with its own conscience, of having women on the staff at Sligo since 1973 and having them being treated differently. And so for me, at least, from my perspective, it was very much an issue that was an ethical one. That is, we as a congregation, we're not telling anybody outside this church what to do. And we're going to have it in an afternoon service, so it's not anyone you know, who comes for worship isn't going to be surprised by this and being forced to participate in this um, ordination service. But that we can no longer live with our conscience. <laughs> that this for us is a moral issue. It's a gospel issue. Um, and that kind of language I recall in some of those conversations. So I just wanted to give that perspective on at least back to the mid-1990s for my community, and, and I realize other communities were wrestling with similar issues. Um, I appreciate so much um, Dr. Johnson saying that he had voice and vote for many years in his work, and now he has <clears throat> voice and pen. I thought that was a very helpful way to, and, and a challenge to many of us in this room. Um, but I also immediately made me think of those who over the decades have had neither. And it just made me pause at that um, and say, who hasn't had either of those um, opportunities? Uh, and yeah, and I, I thought of, I, I, I thought of the women pastors in China who we did not hear from at San Antonio. And it seems to me that that is a tragedy of the San Antonio story. Um, what does it mean to have voice and pen? What does it mean to have voice and vote? What does it mean for us to think about those who have neither? Um, many years ago at the seminary in Daniel Augsburger's ethics class, I remember him saying that, that we're all at our best when we are looking out for the other, when we are fighting for the other's rights and not our own. Uh, that stayed with me all these years. I would modify it a bit though now. Um, I would say that we're all at our best, not when I'm speaking for someone else, but when I'm seeing that they have the chance to speak for themselves. And it seems to me that I, I long for my church to, to focus on that and to say whose voices aren't we hearing right now. Um, I know I'm supposed to stay with chapter one, but I just have to say that I found it fascinating to read the whole book and especially to think about chapters one and three together, one and, one and three, because um, it made me think about, and maybe this is too harsh a statement, certainly it's too generalized, but I did think about how the side of Adventism that wants imminent eschatology doesn't want to celebrate what the Spirit is doing now. And I saw that, again, it's too stark, it's too, it should be nuanced, but it seems to me that, that to focus on imminent eschatology in so many cases is to ignore what the Spirit is doing. And that that is an awesome thing, to reject the Spirit. And yes, I, I pray that um, we won't keep doing that. On page 154, which is outside of the chapter, um, I know, that's when uh, Dr. Johnson is talking about Tosk and how these two opposite understandings of the ordination of women emerge and are part of the air that we all breathe and we know that. Um, and so let me just for a few moments talk about being involved in Tosk. It is true, as the introduction said, that I was involved for two years in the NAD, uh, what they call BRC, Biblical Research Committee. Um, the idea was that 
Each division would have a committee that would look into this question. And then when the international committee was started, that there would be reports from all of the division committees into the large start of the division ones in most cases. Um, some of the work was happening concurrently. But um, I was on both. I was on the North American Division one, which was a smaller group. I think, I think 12, don't quote me on that because I'd have to look at the list. And on the international one, which had 105 people. I want to talk with you about the specifics of that in a minute. Um, I think it should be stated from the onset that, that many of us that went actually talked in advance about potential and the likelihood of being manipulated by being a part of this. Um, it wasn't that we went and thought, oh, this is going to be great, and then were surprised that some of what happened in the TOSC meetings was not made public. Um, we knew going in, many of us knew going in, that that could be the case. But we felt that, that having been invited to be a voice, we should agree to be a voice. And um, in some cases, we could imagine people that should have been on the list rather than, than us being invited. Um, theologians, for example, on a theology committee. You know, that would make sense. Um, and there were so few trained theologians, some, but not as many as there should be. So, but having been invited, it seemed wrong not to agree to go and be part of that. And, um, yeah, we can talk in the Q&A depending on how much you'd like me to talk about. Um, I, I am amazed at how raw it still is. I, I put it aside and then this kind of an opportunity asks me to go back and read my notes again. And it is not a pleasant thing to do. Um, uh, there will be a closeness to some of us who served on that together. There will be a closeness for our whole entire lives. Um, how I imagine a little bit about sort of men who've gone to war together. Um, there's a bond. Um, there's lots of things I could say about personal moments. Uh, there have been times when I would go into the women's restroom um, and there would be women in there sobbing. And we were not always on this, not necessarily women who all agreed with each other, but just to hear what we heard hour after hour after hour, the rhetoric, the anti-women rhetoric that we listened to was something I had never experienced that before. And um, anyway, again, I can talk more about that, but it's probably better for me to stick to my notes. Um, the first TOSC meeting took place in uh, January of 2013. The second one in July of 2013, the third one in January of 2014, and the final one in June of 2014. So here are the, here are the, um, the folders of materials from those four meetings. And um, this is the international one. Okay, this is the international one. There were 102 people on the committee, plus three ex officio the president, the secretary, and the treasurer of the general conference. So there was 102 people. Um, and when we went, there was a speech, the very first day, January 2013, there was a very clear speech, because there was a bit of uh, questioning in the room. Hey, we've had lots of commissions. The church has had lots of committees on this topic. And there was a speech made, multiple speeches made. I can remember, uh, one in particular by David Trim. This is different than anything we've done before because this is an international committee looking at this issue. This is different, this is unique, this is going to have more uh, global results. This is going to be something that's more uh, taking into consideration the voices of people from all over the church, the global Adventist church. So this is a new day and this is a, a new endeavor and so we're glad you're here and that was, that was very much the, the sense on that first day. People had, were delegates specifically from every one of the divisions. On the last day of the last meeting, we were told that this was a, a group dominated by the North American division. 
So that was a, a, a 180. And uh, let me just say a couple things between those two years. Um, the, the meeting that by far was the most hopeful, I thought, for church unity was January of 2014. That day we, that particular time we met from Monday evening is when we all gathered and it went through to a Sabbath. Uh, most of the time these were three days, sometimes uh, four or five. But this one was the longest. And this was the one, January 2014, was when we heard the reports from all the different divisions. Thirteen divisions. And one after another would get up and share with the entire group what their division meeting had done. And in some cases, like, like in my case, some of us were sitting there who sat on both. But the majority of the people were, were their, conference pre uh, their division presidents. They were representing what their division uh, group had done. The work that they had, and some created um, major documents. This was the North American Division set of documents. So in some cases, they were huge documents. Sometimes it was just a short report. They hadn't uh, spent as much time, hadn't created as much work, but they had, had gotten together and they were sharing their report. Out of the 13, and I realize that people have shared these results in different ways. And because of complexity of the issue, I can see how there could be different ways of understanding it. But I would share with you that this is a, a conservative way of sharing. I'm trying to be honest and true and nuanced. This. Six divisions definitely said yes to the ordination of women. Five said no, but we would support the world church's decision. So, and they had different ways of saying that. No, but we're not ready in our division yet. No, but um, we would be supportive of diversity on this issue across the world church. Okay, so five no, but one said no, yet we agree that this is a complex issue. So I don't know where you want to put that person, but uh, no. And then one was a straight no, absolutely no, no, never. One out of 13 was there. Now, I just share that with you and realize that because of the complexity of this issue, you can, how did you say it, Gil? You could, if you're looking for a yes, yeah. you can see a yes or a possibility. If you're looking for a no, you're going to emphasize the no. Do you hear what I'm saying? But I just want to know, sitting there, listening to these reports over <coughs> several days, those of us who were for ordination were just flying. I mean, we couldn't believe it. This was a new day. We absolutely couldn't believe it. That there were so, there were so many people in our division, uh, in the divisions, at the leadership level at least, in these, in these smaller study groups that were open. We were absolutely stunned. And it was just an amazing time. And then, I don't know what happened between January and June. But when we arrived in, at June, we suddenly were shown that there was this third way that's going to bring us all together. And rather than do a straight yes or no vote, by the end of that last set of meetings in June 2014, we actually were asked to vote three ways. Yet, uh, yes, no, sorry, should, the other way. No, yes, and... We're in I, the second base. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. It was this... Not the it idea. was theologically no, but practically okay, we'll let you do it. It was kind of like that, that argument. Theologically, it men should be the head of the church. But because of circumstances God's and accommodation. God's accommodation in the past, let's yeah. allow, it for, we'll allow for that accommodation. Yeah. yeah. And it was amazing to me that some people thought, because we were told from the front before we got ready to vote, that uh, we, could, we could vote as many times as we felt our conscience. And I was thinking, what? How could you, how could you vote more than one time? I, I didn't understand how you could possibly vote more than one category. But, and, and interestingly enough, people like me were for the first time in two years agreeing with people on the other far side because they were also seeing the inconsistency of that. So it was very interesting. Um, but some were able to. So, and I know you've probably seen these numbers, but you could vote your first, second, or third choice. Again, this, this is one of my greatest regrets, uh, that 
we didn't push for just a straight yes or no because it got a little bit confusing. But anyway, um, the I don't know how you if you want me to give you these raw numbers. It's not very interesting because but okay, Gil's saying no. But um, it was if those who were open to ordination, okay, either because of their uh, straight yes, which is by far the, the largest number, forty straight. 40. And then if you were okay with this third way, which allowed for ordination, 22 out of the group, 73.2% were okay with ordination out of the group. Um, I sat next to Elder Wilson um, on that day, that particular day, and I watched as he handed in his ballot. I decided not to make small talk at that moment, but um, uh, it was interesting to me that, that he, he was there and uh, I think it was 95 votes came in um, on that on that day. Now I, I think it's interesting. Yes, I know. I know that's true. Look at the time. Okay, let me just say this last little bit. Archer Stella got up after the vote and thanked um, all of us for the work that we've done. I'll skip some of the other things I, I wrote. I was typing as fast as I could to have this verbatim for future moments like this. Um, and then Elder Wilson got up and he said this, um, I don't want anyone to th leave this place thinking that it was a waste of time. This was a very important thing. We looked at scholarly ways and spiritual ways, not that those are mutually exclusive, um, and, and we will leave here with differences of opinions. We took a straw poll. It's not a binding instrument. It's to test the waters, to learn opinions. The last thing I would like any of you to share is that there was confusion at this last survey or strong poll. It became a survey, not a vote. Um, there cannot be confusion about what was done here. The poll showed that there is considerable dis difference of opinion, and this group is not deciding. The group is essentially 80% from North America. This is the place where there has been considerable debate and difference of opinion. If we had done this and set it up as a more representative group, it would have been a considerably different composition. But the purpose was not to get an idea of how many people are for or against this or that, but to study the question. In fact, this was a Theology of Ordination Study Committee. At this point in time, this is probably the way we will be proceeding. What will happen next in the next few weeks, he began to explain at annual council, etc. So I just wanted you to get that uh, take on someone who was there. Lots of things we could talk about. Sorry I went so long, but I just wanted you to have a sense of um, of the sequence of events in those four meetings that took place over two, two years. So, if Forrest can come and steer the questions for us. Yeah. Um, the meetings in London just concluded last weekend, significant meetings. One of the major issues in George Knight's paper, you should read his paper, it's online, dealt with the problem as to how all of the work of TOS could not be reported to the church, and that it was done in a, I think the term was in a manipulative way to achieve an outcome by a small group at the GC rather than the broad committee. That a major issue in the discussions at London, which of course has led to the whole problem, how do we keep unified? Well, thank you. We'll now have question and answer, and I'm gonna ask that you make your question as concise as possible. So we'll have people watching us at a later time. So this will be enjoyable for them. I'm going to have to have you uh, share that microphone oh, okay. with one another. You don't mind getting close to one another. Do you? We enjoy <laughs> that. Okay. So, uh, by the way, last week I missed somebody, my good friend Sharon. Uh, she raised her hand and I didn't see it. And she had this uh, breakdown from the New York Times of different church groups uh, that have women uh, in their, uh, uh, women leaders and Adventism is way, way, way down. So uh, that shouldn't surprise us. But uh, it was in I, it was early June, I think, uh, this article. So anyway, I'm going to start here. If you raise your hand, and uh, well, I see a hand, and so we'll start here. Why weren't the results um, that you mentioned here not reportable to the Adventist Church at large? The one question. The second was, what kind of anti-women rhetoric were you hearing? In to what? Just ordination? Yeah, let me deal with the second question first. Um, there was, uh, I was amazed at this, in fact many of us were, that there was definitely um, a, a plan, it seems to me, given the papers, 
to have the Adventist Church adopt headship theology. That is that act as, as though, and, and I think people probably, I don't know if some people think this is actually true to our history, but to, the idea that, that, but that was the argument, was that that headship is part of being an Adventist, headship theology. So there was, uh, there was actually a graphic at one point, I'll never forget it, where God and then an arrow pointing down to Jesus, and an arrow pointing down to man, and an arrow pointing down to woman. And you know, you can imagine that some of the people in the room said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're Protestants here, <laughs> and getting very nervous about um, what this means for our understanding of all kinds of theological issues. So there was that kind of, there was a lot of papers presented that were advocating headship theology. And I think that it really did surprise some of us that that was so mainstream in some of the papers. Now you can see from the final vote um, that it, it, you know, those were the strong voices presenting papers that wasn't necessarily being adopted by those in the room. But that was it. And, and just, just language about um, with, women as not able to, to do certain things. And just that kind of language is just something I'm not used to. <laughs> My colleagues treat me like a colleague. And um, I'm not used to uh, hearing that kind of rhetoric. So, oh, all kinds of things. And, and the importance of the home and being a, uh, the, the beauty of being a, a wife and mother and those kinds of things just being said hour after hour. Um, and 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 exclusive language when it comes to the 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 followers of God and just just all those kinds of things began to build up after a while, and even for the, those women who weren't sure about ordination or who maybe even didn't want it for women, you could you could see it draining them as well. It was very interesting. We kind of supported each other uh, at times when we could. Um, yeah, I was I was surprised at the sort of spontaneous. Uh, break, breaking into tears that would happen just because you're, you're living through this. Um, your first question is, I, I don't know really how to answer it. Um, I, I believe that Arthur Stella, our, our committee chair, was hoping to share the results. I mean, he probably put more time into this than anybody else as the committee chair. And um, he and his team, Karen Porter and others, I think were hoping that the work would be shared and widely distributed and that the, the um, presentations that were made at San Antonio would show a clear way forward. I don't know how to better answer that uh, question as to why that wasn't shared um, more clearly with the, the larger group at San Antonio. But the documentation that's even now available on, on the website shows that uh, at the end of the TOSC process, there is an attempt to undermine its validity by saying this wasn't international. But the chair of the conference goes and says, well, we started out as an international conference, and look, even the people that might be from North America are actually are from overseas, they might be living here. But there was a, not a, an open dispute, but an open disagreement between how valid the group was. Was it, was it truly an international representative group? even between the chair and the chair's senior. You know, I have a question. Uh, I was at the 2012 uh, Pacific Union meeting, and I was at the last year's constituency meeting, uh, where we voted to affirm our vote in 2012. But in 2012, when Elder Wilson was there, there was an understanding that what the committee would concluded scripturally that's what we were going to do. Uh, it seems like there was a moving of the goalpost. And I know we've been accused of being poor sports because we didn't go along with the vote. I think we did. I think we moved the goalposts. And I want to respond to that. That was definitely part of the language of the first meeting. It was absolutely part of the, you know, that this is sort of the definitive, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if that's the exact word, although it sure felt like it, this is the definitive commission or study on this topic. And and, and because of that, I think, I think that that, even though you, now the makeup of the committee is, is being contested, I would say that that, that will be held on to um, for the future. I mean, I, I will be shocked if there will be another commission in, in a while on this topic, because this was the one. We, why would we need to study this anymore? 
Thank you. It looks like Phyllis Shafley was there, too. Um, <laughs> um, did you consider, sorry, um, did you consider what would the church look like if the vote was for including women? Because that is a complete um, destruction of what the structure we already have as far as headship. I mean, was there provision that like, if we go for the ordination, things that would change? Because that's what happened to Equal Rights Amendment with Ms. Shaffley. She promoted that if women have equal rights in the Constitution, no amendment, then the whole structure of American um, society will be changed. So uh, this is not an unusual argument. She won, we don't have equal rights because of that. Because the, um, so I'm asking, was there any provision among you guys to say, okay, now if we give women ordination, would there be any changes that we need to remedy that the changes that the church has to do will be uh, predicted? Um, I don't, is that a question? Yes, I think I understand your question. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, with what I'm sharing. Um, I would say to your question that the vast majority of responses were theological and historical to headship and not sociological. To, so, you know, to, to be fair to your observation, I don't think that many of us in the room took that angle, nor were specialists in taking that angle. And so we would challenge the headship theology based on theological, biblical, and historical questions. But I think they anticipate that if that question was reversed into, then there would be a discombobulation of social structure. And that's what happened. And, um, you could be right, I can't read their minds, but their arguments on paper were more theological and historical and um, biblical. But thank you so much. Why were the Chinese uh, excluded if they were? Yeah, I don't know, and if anyone does, I would love to know the, the question, the answer to the question. Um, I will say that, um, on that particular day, as you well know, a lot of us were excluded. I mean, in some ways, I felt like I'd been preparing my speech for 30 years, and I'd never made it to the microphone. And that's after handing my badge at the minute they said, we'll take your questions now. So it just stuns me. Um, Gil knows how long I worked on that speech. <laughs> yeah, she should be preparing that speech for a long, long time. It wasn't just the Chinese uh, women that were excluded. People from Denmark didn't get a voice. And their position was, there are laws in Denmark about equal access to, to roles in the church, and, and we need to have a legal perspective on this. You need to hear our voice. But they didn't get a chance to, to speak either. In one sense, it was the best of our attempts to conduct a, a reasonable debate on the issue. It was going to be difficult anyway with 2,000 delegates. Um, but looking back on it, I think it was really very poorly handled, the, the whole debate. I've done an in-depth study of how the Anglican Church handled their move towards the ordination and the priesting of women. And the, the level of debate, the structures of the debate, the, the distribution of papers, the, the processes of management of change were, were much more informed and mature. We are not good at managing change, and we need to learn the art of managing change. Gil, I have a uh, question oh, for yeah. Gil. <laughs> I liked your observation about uh, raising the hand for Ellen White's ordination. What if there was a local conference who wanted a woman ordained, but was not allowed to ordain her, but they paid her an ordained woman's salary year after year. I think Dr. Johnson quotes someone from the General Conference. If it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, <laughs> no. it, it's, it's duck. making distinctions where there ought not to be any distinctions. That, that wasn't a pejorative comment about. I 
Yes. 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 I have a very difficult time respecting leadership that doesn't treat women as equal. The question is, what now? The, uh, the London meetings are grappling with that question. Um, trying to, to create an environment where we can move forward. Um, and uh, the reports on, on the meeting are, are very positive. There were very good papers produced. There were 10, you've heard the story of the London meetings, the 10 unions that got together, primarily under the, at the initiative of the president of the New Zealand Pacific Union Conference, who sat through an annual council and was horrified at the arrival of the document on, on uh, unity and the fact that the nuclear option was being considered. And, and he was so distressed about that that he talked to other union presidents, and as a result, those 10 union presidents and a lot of others got together in London last weekend, looking at, at serious ways forward. Um, and hopefully, I mean, did you read George Knight's letter on Adventist Today? Yes. Yesterday? <laughs> A call to stand together, those 10 unions and others. Is this the time for the, the 46 princes of, of Germany to stand against the government? I mean, it, it's come to, to that. So the, there is a, a very Christian, very sensitive, and, and wanting to do things in the right way without just being militant and mad, but a serious attempt to try and get things straightened around. And hopefully, Something like the London Conference will help us to, uh, to be able to make progress and bring a situation where we do have leadership that is embracing of women in, in ministry. It's in our fundamental beliefs, the equality of all believers. Yeah. This, is, this website has all the papers. AdventistUnity2017.com Please. I haven't had a chance to see what came out yesterday, but... Um, I have a concern, you mentioned the goalposts moving. I remember watching at, at, after San Antonio, Dr. Wilson, or Elder Wilson say several times that nothing will change. Nothing has changed. The unions are still in charge of ordination. He went through the specifics. And then the next thing to come out was the unity document with the idea for punishing the rebellious unions who were going by their conscience. This is so anti-Adventist. <laughs> but again, it, it's like moving the goalpost, not paying any attention to the fact that theologians had found neither pro or con about ordaining women. I could be wrong, but I think Elder Wilson was responding to a question that I gave him from the floor which was deemed out of order, but he still answered it, for which I was grateful, um, because I asked him, we were already getting reports that women pastors in some parts of the world were already losing their jobs, and um, that women elders even were being dismissed from their duties in their local church. And so I asked him from the floor about that very issue. And I, again, I don't know if exactly this is what you heard, but it was at that point he said, nothing has changed. Women pastors who are commissioned only and women elders, are, that is still our policy of our church that this is appropriate for women to serve in those ways. So I wanted to have that, you know, <laughs> stated, and I hope that that word got around. But I fear for my sisters in different parts of our world church. Um, but, but he was right in saying that this, what was defeated, remember what was defeated at San Antonio was the request to have divisions decide this. That's what was defeated. So it's, um, again, if you, if you say that, that that didn't happen, we're still where we are. If you, if you agree with some of the works that have come out on church polity, we're still where unions decide about ordination, and therefore it's a diverse church. And it seems to me that's what Dr. Johnson is, is suggesting when it, when it comes to that the wall is down, um, that, that this is the church that is our reality right now.
Yeah, my comments were basically what you just summarized, and that is, let's don't forget the title of Bill's chapter. The battle is over. The horse is out of the barn. I think he even uses that uh, phrase. Um, so that doesn't, uh, but the wave is on the way. And I think that let's, let's remember that. Yes. Even though the uh, some of the, I could leave this morning quite discouraged from some of what you said, but let's remember that the wave is, is there. And, it's and we can't stop the door. Yeah, exactly. The door and I too have been, I've been concerned about this Sabbath school because it is so painful to remember what's so painful. And so right before coming here, I got out the Gospel of Mark again. And to follow the radical Jesus is an amazing reminder that it's not about position of authority, right? He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. May Jesus continue to be the, the Lord of, of our, the church that we love so much. Okay, we uh, need to conclude our regular part here. You the folks don't mind standing, staying by? Okay, I'm sure there'll be some more questions. Those who would like to leave, please leave. And the rest stay here and we'll continue this discussion. So, But let's have our benediction first. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Okay, so more questions here? Oh.